It is on me to honor the instructions that God gives me from the people he's placed in my life. Honor, watch this, honor is the reward for somebody's difference. Honor is the key to access. Whatever you honor, you attract. Whatever you dishonor, you repel. Whatever you honor, you open. Whatever you dishonor, you close. Whatever you dishonor, you lose access to. Whatever you honor, you gain access to. If you get in the room of something you dishonor, they can feel that you don't want to be there. Honor is the key to access. So when a mentor or when, when the Lord gives you an instruction, the Bible says we have to walk by wisdom. Wisdom in the, in the Hebrew is actually a feminine term in a noun position. And instruction is a verb term, is a male term in a verb position. And so literally, he says, when I give you an instruction, I am sowing seed into the womb of your wisdom. And your wisdom is going to be the ability or inability to bring an instruction full term. So when God gives me an instruction, he's sowing it into the womb of my wisdom to see if I can take that instruction to full term or if I will forfeit it along the way. And if at some point I dishonor the instruction, I will abort the thing God has made me pregnant with. Somebody shout honor. Honor matters. Honor is important. You have to honor the word of the Holy Spirit. The, uh, the Holy Spirit is the greatest mentor you could ever ask for. The, great, the Holy Spirit is your greatest friend. He is your greatest mentor. He is the anointing who teaches you all things. The Holy Spirit is your mentor. The Bible says do not quench the Holy Spirit. It says do not grieve the Holy Spirit. It says do not despise prophesying or as the Holy Spirit starts talking, don't despise it. Don't shut down the voice of your conscience. As the Holy Spirit is talking, he is your greatest mentor. And your greatest days of breakthrough are on the other side of honoring the voice of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we honor your voice. He is the invisible person of Jesus. He is the governor of the kingdom of God. He is God in the earth realm. He is the only one Jesus fully authorized to stand in his stead when he left. He's the only reason Jesus would vacate the earth so the Holy Ghost could take his place. And the Holy Spirit could fill a space that even Jesus in his natural body could not fill. His name is Holy Spirit. He is your paraclete. He comes beside your right hand and guides you into your next dimension. He comforts you when comfort is not around. He gives you peace when you don't understand it. He is your revelation when you need an insight. He is your strength when you feel weak. His name is Holy Spirit. He is invisible, but he is all powerful. And if you can't honor the Holy Spirit, you will forfeit what the whole, I feel my Holy Ghost right here. You will forfeit what he has for you. Does anybody love the Holy Spirit? He is not a spooky thing. He is not a feeling. He is not a goosebump. He comes with fire, but he is more than fire. He will speak to you in the midnight hour and turn your morning all the way into dancing. He is your friend when everybody else leaves you. Somebody give the Lord praise for about 10 seconds if you're grateful for the work of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. High five somebody and say it's time to do as the occasion demands. Come on, something is coming. Tell somebody else it's time to do as the occasion demands. I could talk about the Holy Spirit for a year. I don't want to turn my whole message there, but you have to honor the Holy Spirit. You have to honor the Holy Spirit. Number two, you have to always come with the seed that God demands. When Saul is about to enter into the presence of Samuel, he says, what do we have to give? I, gave, I ate all of my bread. I let my appetite eat stuff I was supposed to sow. What do we have to give? And the servant said, oh, I didn't eat everything. I set a part aside one-fourth of a shekel that we can give to the man of God. One of the reasons why I think Saul was unable to sustain the breakthrough that God gave him was because it's hard to sustain a harvest you won't sow for. He borrowed somebody else's seed and sowed it into a moment God meant for him. See, if you eat everything you have, you'll have nothing left to sow in a moment of opportunity. I'm not just talking about your money. I'm talking about your decisions. I'm talking about your energy. If you waste all your energy on stuff you're not supposed to, when you get to the divine moment of God, you'll have no more energy to sow. And I can't sustain a breakthrough on borrowed energy. I can't sustain a harvest on somebody else's seed. So, so I got a lot to share, so I got to keep going. That's the second thing it demands, and here's the main thing I want to talk about today. It will demand quality decisions. 
Somebody write that down big in your notes. It will demand quality decisions. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter number 30 and let me build this case. You get anything out of this church or you receiving anything so far? Deuteronomy chapter number 30. And I want to read verse number 15 to verse number 20. See, I have said before you today, life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply and the Lord your God will bless you in the land in which you enter. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear me and you draw away from me or are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, I'm going to help you out. Choose life that both you and your kids may experience the life that I have for you. Oh, I love the word of God. Does anybody else love the word of God? The, we have taught you forever that the word, the Bible is not a religious book. The Bible is a kingdom book. It is the constitution of Christ's heavenly kingdom. We have taught you that the Bible is, is, is a book of wisdom. It is the mind of God on measured and miraculous display. It is the only place you will find the counsels of the Almighty fully displayed. My God. When you get into that word, you commune with the Holy Spirit. We have taught you that the word of God is a book of keys. It is a book of divine laws and principles that govern every single action in life. Whether or not you're in a relationship with God, if you honor the principles of God and apply the keys of God, you will experience the rewards God intended that principle to give you. How much more should the body of Christ walk in the fulfillment of the divine keys of God? That, Bi that Bible is a book of keys. That Bible is a book of wisdom. That Bible is the constitution of the kingdom. But today I want to draw your attention to this. The Bible is a book of decisions. The Bible is a book of decisions. It's the greatest resource on decision making ever created. And it teaches that God subjects himself to the power of my decisions. God will limit his power to the power of my decisions. Jesus said, you, by your commandments, have made the word of God of no effect. In other words, you made a decision that made the word ineffective. Your decisions can make the word effective. Your decisions can make the word ineffective. Not over my life, but over your life. Your decisions can unlock the effectiveness of the word of God. There is a word God can send that has incredible effect in your season, and you can make a decision that voids the effect of that particular word. Your decisions are powerful. The quality of your life will follow the quality of your decisions. Decision-making is powerful. The Bible says death entered the world because Adam made a bad decision. Salvation entered the world because Jesus made the right decision. Decisions are more powerful than many people have ever told you. The quality of our life will follow the quality of our decisions. What God will do, you got to understand this. The results of a decision are all, not always manifest immediately. Sometimes it takes decades to show you the impact of a particular decision. But every decision, write this down, is a present seed for a future outcome. Every decision is a present seed for a future outcome. Your destiny is your decision. Destiny is a decision. Destiny is a decision. I need you to get this. Destiny is a decision. Destiny is not an accident. Destiny is not a mistake. Destiny is not a foregone conclusion. Destiny has always been and will always be a decision. Your destiny is hidden in the package of your personal choices. My destiny is hidden in the package of my personal choices. Watch this. Success is the reward of good decisions. Every decision reveals my faith or my doubt. Every decision reveals my trust or my lack of trust my confidence or my lack of confidence, my hope or my hopelessness. They can be heard in your conversations and seen in your decisions. Decisions are absolutely powerful. The decision to trust God, the decision to not trust God, the decision to obey, the decision to not obey, the decision to praise. Joy is a decision. Peace is a decision. 
A relationship is a decision. Longevity is a decision. Commitment is a decision. Walking through hard stuff, endurance is a decision. Somebody shout, destiny is a decision. It is not a foregone conclusion. God made his decision. I have to make mine now. God decided it before I was in my mother's womb. Now I have to decide it while I walk on the face of the earth. Destiny is a decision. Your decisions schedule your success in the kingdom of God. A decision is the innate capacity to make a choice. Choice means options are available. You cannot make a decision if you do not have options. Your enemy wants you to think you have no options. When he shows up to tempt you, he makes you feel like that's your only option. But if you can make a decision, then you always have another option. The, the Bible says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I decide to fear no evil for I know thou art. Somebody shout, I got options. I got options. I, I'm coming to tell you, you got more options than you realize. Your destiny is not my decision. Your destiny will not be dictated by another. It will be decided by you. Somebody shout, it's a decision. Now, go to Psalm 23. Watch this. Let me take a break. I need to show you this. Psalm 23. I need five more minutes. Psalm 23, verse number five and six. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days. I'm feeling happy right here. All the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now watch this. He, he says, you prepare a table before me. A table is a context with options set upon it. I have, in other words, you prepare options before me in the presence, my, I feel the Holy Ghost, in the presence of my enemies. Right when my adversary shows up, you move what he wants to do and you set options in front of me. I can choose to rejoice over the oil on my head or I can choose to rejoice over the wine overflowing in my cup or I can choose to rejoice at the seat that is at that table or I can choose to say the enemy is the option but I came to say the devil is a liar. God gives you options in the presence of your enemy. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me every minute of my life. Give your God some praise, church, if you know the kingdom is a kingdom of option. Come on, slap somebody's hand and say, you got an option. You got an option. The occasion will demand quality decisions. The occasion will demand quality decisions. The outcome of the season you are entering is not on God. It's on your decision. I have to decide to praise. I have to decide to think. I have to decide to speak the word. I have to decide to prepare. I have to decide to accept the invitation. My decision determines my destiny. I'm sorry. I'm not mad. I just feel the Holy Spirit. Somebody shout, it's my decision. That means when God robbed principalities and powers, he snatched their power over your decision away and said, all power is in your hands now. I give you the keys and whatever you bind on earth. I got to slow down. I, my God in heaven. Somebody shout, my destiny is my decision. So the Holy Spirit is your decision-making engine. He helps you make quality decisions. My God. The right decision is never a wrong choice. The right thing to do is always the right thing to do. The moral decision is always the right decision. It might not be the popular decision, but it is the right decision. And God will reward you because when you make a decision, you're scheduling your success. It's a decision. Somebody shout, it's a decision. So, so watch, this is powerful because David didn't slay Goliath with the first stone he chose. He chose five stones. He slayed Goliath with the first stone, stone he threw. He had options. He got five smooth stones out of the river of the spirit and said, devil, I can take you down with options. Somebody shout, I got options, I got options. To throw is to launch. I'm prophesying over somebody. There is something you're about to launch that's going to nail that big-headed devil right in its head. It's going to nail poverty in its head. It's going to nail resistance in its head. It's going to nail every utter... And make that head... Somebody shout, it's time to launch it. Come on. 
Tell somebody it's time to launch it. It's time now. Watch, watch, watch. We gotta make you gotta make a decision. So watch this. My life is driven by my choices. I don't have to stay where they drop me. Where they left me is not where my life ends. My life doesn't end where they decided. I have sent before you life and death. I didn't set your life before them. I set your life before you. I call heaven and earth to witness against you. God said this. He said, oh, God, I need five minutes. Can I have five minutes? Okay. All right. I'm serious. Just five minutes. God said, heaven, I want you to record this reality. Earth, I want you to record this reality. Their life is not on me. God said, heaven, bear record. What they do with their life is not on me. I said it before them. Earth, I want a witness of this. What they experience, blessing or cursing, life or death, good or evil, it's not on me. I already gave them good life. The thoughts I have towards them, heaven, you know this, are good and not evil. But I have taken what I made there, watch, and set it here. He said, heaven, I want you to record. Remember what I wrote in the books about them? I took it from there, and I set it right here. Earth, I want you to see that you are to respond to the decisions they make. Oh. Heaven is encoded to respond to your decision. If you bind it, heaven binds it. If you lose it, heaven loses it. If you want it, heaven helps you get it. If you don't want it, heaven tries to block. He said, heaven and earth, I want you to record this reality. It's on their decision. Oh, God. He said, I have said it before your face. I haven't said it in your future. I haven't said it five years away. I haven't said it 10 years away. I said it right in your face. Behold, the word is nigh thee, even in your mouth. What he's saying is, you want to know an authorized utterance? Open your mouth. Whatever you say is authorized in your life. He said, I took it out of the books of heaven, and I put it right in your face. That means everywhere you look, all you see is options. What I wore today is a decision. Bad one, good one, you be the judge later. But it's a decision. <laughs> Who I married was a decision. The best decision I've ever made. That's a good decision right there. My God, that's a good decision. Somebody shout, it's a decision. Heaven and earth, I want you to record this. When I speak my word, whether or not they fulfill it is not up to me. I said it before their face. I made it an option for them. It's up to them. Now, watch this. All it takes is one decision to change everything. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, and I'm done. One decision. A single decision can turn the state of affairs. A single decision. A single decision can turn mourning to dancing. A single decision can bring you out of something toxic into something triumphant. One decision. One decision. One decision. I returned and I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. But time and chance happen to them all. Uh, he said, I don't care how slow your life is moving. When you hit the right time, you can win something you were too slow to be in front of. Time has the power to override skill. I need you to get this. This is... Uh, Time and chance happen to everybody. Not everybody is born fast. Not everybody is born hyper-intelligent. Everybody's born smart by the genius of God, but everybody's born hyper-intelligent. Not everybody is born with this incredible skill. But what everybody does have is a time. 
and a chance. Ugh. God said, I have encoded in your life experience that at some point in your life, you will hit a moment of divine opportunity. Everybody, no matter where you were born, where you were raised, least of the house of Benjamin, Saul, you're going to hit a moment that God says, now is your time to excel. You might not feel like it, but everybody gets a time and a chance. Oh, my God. I got I to pre preach. I got to close this down. Everybody gets a time and a chance. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody gets a time and a chance. Ecclesiastes 3, he says, there's a time to be born, and there's a time to die. There's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. There's a time to kill, and a time to give life. You might be in a time of death, but you'll run into a time and a chance. So God said, I have, I have scheduled opportunities that will override the season you're in. And the decision you make in that moment of time if you do as the occasion demands, you will extract an elevation, God Almighty, that I have planned for your life. I declare over somebody, you're entering your day of a divine time and a divine season. Something is coming in your life that is over your skill and over your education and over your speed and over your wisdom and over those things. It's a divine time that you're going to seize and launch into what God has called you to step in. I decree times manifest, seasons manifest, opportunities manifest, situations. Tell somebody it's your time, son. It's your time, daughter. It's your time, brother. Tell somebody else, it's your time. I'm declaring that God said, you could be the least of the house, but I have a time appointed for you. I have a season appointed for you. I have a moment of opportunity that I've scheduled on your behalf that nobody can stop. Nobody. Nobody. But here's what I need you to do. Do as the occasion demands. What happens in that moment that the Lord showed me is coming in so many people's lives is not going to be dependent on what he said alone, but it's what you decide to do. And Lord, we raise our hands and say, we will obey your instruction. We will obey the leadership of your Holy Spirit. We will seize the moment that you have given us in Jesus' name. I'm going to say this and I'm going to bless you. The greatest thing you can do before you enter your opportunity is have seasons of preparation. Preparation is proof I'm ready to qualify for the door God's about to open. Bless your people.